Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Um, to those of you who are on Zoom, good to not see you, but have you here. Uh, there's somebody. Yay. Um, when I got asked to do this some time ago, uh, John, John called me up and said, Dan, I always come to you to do something biblical or spiritual. <laughs> He said, I always want to have a seminar that's either biblical or spiritual. So um, I thought about it and I thought, okay, I'll try to do something, John. And I floated this idea of uh, faith is a journey, not a destination. Metaphors be with you. And uh, the title was rejected by the seminar committee. They liked the first part, faith is a journey, not a destination, but didn't like uh, so much metaphors be with you, didn't think many people would come. So I took it off until last night and I put it back on because basically this is about metaphors. Um, so uh, seeing how this is how we're going to do this, I'd like to invite you all to take out your Bibles. Oh, yeah, we're at UCG. Um, don't worry, most every congregation I've ever been in, if they have one, it's at home, uh, growing dusty on the desk beside, uh, beside their bed. So uh, don't worry about that. I'm going to share some scriptures with you as we go along. Um, but first, let's, let me talk just a little bit about what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be talking about road trips. And the Bible is filled with them. Um, and we'll talk about a few in a minute. But I want us to think about road trips as perhaps models uh, of, uh, of things and ways to learn and grow in faith. I've just gotten through taking several road trips lately. I was just down in Davie a couple of weeks ago at a speaking event. Got to do the whole drive to South Florida thing. Last week, I was in Lexington, Kentucky. I chose to drive because I wanted to do a number of things and see people, but mostly because I wanted to see the fall colors. Because I miss that, and we don't get that here very much. So road trips, they're, they're, they're a thing we do, um, and it's, it's important. But I want us to think about road trips primarily as metaphor. And so I wanted to play with this quote from Emily Dickinson just a little bit. Tell all the truth but tell it slant. Sometimes you can't just be blunt and say what you want to say because people get turned off. But sometimes if you use a figure of speech, a bit of poetry, a metaphor, you can make a point that people might go, okay, okay. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. We're going to be gradual here uh, as we talk. So I, I want us to, uh, to look at... Uh, some early Bible road trips from the First Testament, or most of us call it the Old Testament. Um, most of these are going to be road trips either to or from. I want you to think about Adam and Eve right there at the very beginning of the very first book in the Bible, Genesis. Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, are brought into being by God and the way that second story of creation goes, they are given one simple rule. You can eat anything you want. You can do almost anything you want, except for one little thing. There's one tree we don't want you to eat the fruit of, says God. And what do Adam and Eve do? They eat the fruit. Um, and there's a little bit of a confrontation where God comes down and looks for them and says to them what happened. Notice I am not reading you verbatim. I'm just telling the story. What happened? And I, I, Adam says, that woman 
that you put here. It ain't my fault, God. It's her fault. But it's really your fault. And God says, okay, get out. First road trip from the garden to God knows where they don't when they leave. First road trip. So that's the first one. Second one, and we're just going to blast through a few of these. Second road trip, Abraham, Abram, and Sarah I. Or later, they'll be called Abraham and Sarah. Road trip. God speaks to Abraham and says, if you go to the place I will show you, I will give you land and descendants. Now, mind you, at this point, Abraham's like 80, 90 years old and has never had kids with Sarah. And God says, go to this place and I will give you descendants, as many as the stars, as many as the sands on the beaches. Go. And Abraham and Sarah go. They're going towards something. Uh, Isaac. Abraham, Isaac is Abraham's son from. He runs away uh, because he, uh, he he's not a very nice guy. Steals a few things from his brother, including his birthright. And when the time comes, he gets scared. He runs from another road trip. Uh, Jacob and sons. We know about Jacob, son of Isaac, and the sons and wives, they end up joining their brother Joseph in Egypt, um, they are running from desperation and running toward food and hope. And then the stories of the, Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Uh, Joseph is, goes from the land where he is raised and goes toward Egypt. But it's not fun because he's sent originally as a slave. Moses has a couple of, uh, of, of, of road trip stories. The first one, after he murders somebody in Egypt, he goes on the run and goes into the mountains. He's running away from Egypt. Then God speaks to him in the burning bush. You know, remember that story? Mm -hmm. Moses is told to go back, and he goes back toward Egypt and begins to speak on behalf of God. And then the key part of the entire First Testament, the Exodus, God's people being led out of slavery in Egypt toward a promised land. It's a from and a toward at the same time. So you get an idea that right from the very beginning of the Bible, there are road trips. And they all have meaning, and they all tell us something besides just history, even if it's history at all. They're giving us models for the way things happen and work. So let's keep playing here. Um, why is that? Yeah, okay. So let's look at the New Testament or Second Testament. Um, I don't know how many of you all know how the New Testament is put together, but there's a series of letters and books. And the first four are the Gospels. And these are the stories about Jesus and his disciples. It's about his teachings. It's about his work. It's about signs and wonders. It's, but it's centered around Jesus. And if you look at them closely, the ministry of Jesus is essentially, according to three of the Gospels, a three-year road trip. He's just moving on and teaching his disciples and encountering whoever he encounters. One of them seems to collapse that journey into a year. But it's essentially the Gospels and the ministry of Jesus extended road trip. Not quite as extended as the Exodus of Moses, which is 40 years. Um, I got to figure out where to aim this thing. All right. I probably, mm, let me see if I turned it off. Nope. Let's try one more. Yeah, go ahead to the next one, if you don't mind. All right. Paul on the road to Damascus. Anybody know that story? Yeah, Paul uh, is someone who hates 
the new sect of Jews called Christians, the followers of Jesus. And so Paul uh, just really doesn't like these people. Um, he thinks they're screwing up his religion. And so Paul is on the road to Damascus with arrest warrants for Christians. He's going to take care of these people. He's going to lock them away, and we're going to kill this sect right in its infancy. That is Paul's plan. And while Paul is making his way on the road to Damascus, he has an experience. Blinding light. Everything changes. He's knocked to the ground, and he's wondering what in the world is going on. And... Well, we'll talk about that again in a few minutes. Can you bump it to the next one? Um, okay, uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Everybody remember that one? There, There is a, a story in Acts where Philip, one of the followers of Jesus, uh, simply encounters an Ethiopian eunuch who is reading the scriptures. He's not Jewish, but he's reading the Jewish scriptures, and he is trying to figure out and understand them. Now, he's Ethiopian, not part of the Jewish people. He is a eunuch. He would not be allowed in the temple if he went to Jerusalem. Um, he's an, essentially an other and Philip's not too sure whether he can become part of the Christians or not until God sends him to the eunuch. And they have a conversation, and the eunuch says to Philip, I don't understand these scriptures I'm reading. And Philip teaches him, and the eunuch says, then what would prevent me from being baptized? So Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. I'm going to try one more. Okay. Ah! Um, I think I got my stuff going backwards, but that's okay. The, the, the other one that I want us to think, and we'll revisit this one too, is the road to Emmaus. Does anybody remember that one? The road to Emmaus takes place on the day of Jesus' resurrection. It is, Jesus has appeared to some of the women who have come to take care of his body in the tomb. Uh, Jesus has made that appearance, and uh, they have reported back to the apostles, and some of them have seen Jesus. But all of Jesus' followers have not, and the story of Emmaus speaks of two. Cleopas, and we don't know who the other one is, maybe his wife, friend, but they are walking along the road, and Jesus, as far as they know, is dead. And they're walking along this road to Emmaus, and they're feeling terrible. And they encounter a stranger, and they have a conversation. And the stranger says, why do you look so down? Why are you so glum? And they say, don't you know about the leader that we've been following named Jesus. And they began to talk back and forth and back and forth. And Jesus says, well, it seems like this was supposed to happen. And they're back and forth and discussing and the Cleopas and his partner are still glum. And the stranger says, let's have breakfast. And they go and they build a campfire and they break bread. And suddenly in the breaking of the bread, Cleopas and the other disciple go, oh, it's Jesus. Oh, it's Jesus. I want to focus on two of these stories, at least for a little bit. Um, and, and we'll go from there. But I want to focus on... The road to Emmaus and the road to Damascus. And think about these two as models for coming 
to faith. And uh, while these stories come out of the Christian scriptures, I think there are ways that we can come to faith from a variety of traditions. So, so don't be locked in that if you're taking a road trip, and I'm up here talking about it, that the road trip inevitably leads to Christian faith. Uh, you'll see that these can be models for coming to faith in a variety of ways. So I want to at least to begin uh, to focus on those two. So, let's go back and talk about Paul. Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus has for a certain large group within what I will call church with a capital C, within the Christian faith, that has become a model for how you become a Christian. Um, most folks that we refer to as evangelicals think you got to have an experience like Paul had. Um, Jesus, when he was talking to Nicodemus way back in the third chapter of the Gospel of John, says, you must be born again. And the evangelicals have taken that to mean you means everybody. And what does being born again looks like? They've decided that the model that Jesus meant for everyone to have is this road to Damascus model where you have what I call a kaboom experience. I'm not a Christian. In fact, Paul is anti-Christian. Something powerful happens and everything changes in that moment. I call these folks baby kaboomers. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, if, do you know people who are newly Christian by having this kind of born-again experience? They want you to have it too, and they want you to have it too, and they want you to have it too, and, and you got to, you got to, you got to. The kaboomers take up a big percentage, most of what we refer to as the evangelical church in the United States of America, and really around the world. The expectation is you will have that powerful kind of experience. I want us to then compare that and contrast that with the road to Emmaus. The road to Emmaus, where Cleopas and the other disciple are walking along, having a conversation, and they have a moment where their eyes open. In the breaking of the bread, they recognize that Jesus is risen and is with them. I refer to those folks as the ahaers. Ahaers. Kaboomers and ahaers. Not the only two models, but those are two primary models in the life of the church today. Now, most of us, but not all of us, I suspect, but most of us at UCG would say we have come to faith through a series of ahas, right? Um, some of us can look back and say, well, I had an experience and things altered for me, but at least at the beginning, uh, uh, it's a series of ahas. I want us to talk a little bit about kaboomers and ahars. And if you turn that way down, I'll be real happy. Um, uh, yeah. Well, it's worth it if you're standing up. <laughs> um, so you got your, your kaboomers and your ahars. And uh, I, I've been in churches that have a pretty good percentage of each. That, for those of you who don't know, I was a pastor for over 40 years. Um, and I've been in churches with a, a fair number of kaboomers and a fair number of ahars, unlike this church. And let me, let, let, let me suggest to you that sometimes those two approaches feel almost incompatible. Kaboomers look at the ahars and say, 
If you can't tell me when and how and how powerfully it happened for you that you came to faith, I don't really trust your experience. Sound familiar? And a lot of us ahars don't really trust kaboomers. Um, I'll tell this on myself. Uh, um, when I go back to a high school reunion and, and see all my old friends, uh, I usually avoid for a while telling them what I do or what I did. Um, and when it finally comes out and say, oh, Dan was a minister. <laughs> But I knew you when. Um, Ahars tend to look at kaboomers sometimes and say, but, but, but I knew you when. How do I know you're different? And so there's this disconnect and, and a lack of trust between these two competing ways of coming to faith. That's a challenge. That's a challenge because there also is a different way of worshiping. If you look at what kaboomers seek in worship and what ahars seek in worship. And so there are debates in churches about how do we do kaboomers? Everything builds to the altar call. There's somebody in the church today who hasn't had their kaboom experience, and it all builds to that. And so uh, I forgot how many verses we repeated of just as I am when I saw Billy Graham in 1972 with uh, Richard Nixon up on the podium with him. Um, hmm? Knoxville, yeah. So, with Nixon? Yeah, with Nixon on the stage with him? Oh, I could tell you so much about that day. Um, but that's not what we're here for. But that was an experience and a half. Um, so, you, you've got your, your kaboomers and your ahars. And there's a lack of trust between the two uh, uh, too often. Um, some churches are kind of, I get it, I get it. But could you at least have an altar call some of the time? And the other side is going, could, could, could you at least at least take a things to a point and let us figure it out? Uh -huh. Get more of that here, right? Um, so... Uh, you get two different approaches to worship, two different approaches to understanding. And ahars tend, tend to think that uh, you might have an aha that takes you in a, a different direction than mine. You might have an aha that takes you to Buddhism. Or an aha that leads you deeper into Jewish faith. An aha that leads you into Christian faith. Um but your ahas are yours, and they're not all the same. So don't look for the road to Emmaus as, as the model for coming to Christian faith. Look to it as a, a model to coming to a new understanding. Uh -huh. So, kaboomers? Not really in this room, huh? You, UCG's not a kaboomer church. And that's good. Um, but I'm glad there are some. Um, here's, here's what has worked in churches like this one. Aha. Uh -huh. I, I have a friend who told me one time, he said, I, I'm getting cast out of my, my Bible study group, uh, and my church is looking at me askance. And I said, what's happened? This was a doctor who has done so much and is as faithful a person as I know. And Bill said, I can't tell them when I was born again. I said, well, Bill, tell me, tell me this. 
Did you grow up going to Sunday school? Yes. Did you pray at the table? Yes. He says, I don't remember when I wasn't a Christian. That means our programs, our tribes, our classes are doing what we hope. That people do not need, if they've had that experience, do not need a kaboom. They need those aha moments. On the other hand, I've got a lot of friends who haven't been in churches. Their kids have never been in a church, and they're 40 years old. Those people, when they begin to look for faith, are looking for something that they've never seen before. They see something in their friends that's different, unusual. And if they come to faith, it is very often arising out of a kaboom moment. We've got a whole slew of people that need to have kaboom moments to go more deeply into faith. And we're going to have to trust each other as new generations come along and need to come to faith in ways that we did not. And so that's going to be a challenge for the future church is that a whole bunch of us grew up in a series of aha moments, a road to Emmaus moments, and a whole nother set of people are coming to faith through road to Damascus moments. Kaboom versus aha. All right. I can't even tell where I am. There we go. Um, there's some other roads. The road to Jericho. Remember that? Good Samaritan. Guy's on the road and he gets attacked and gets ignored by the religious people. And it's somebody outside the faith comes to him. I would say he had a kaboom moment, but it wasn't to faith. It just was a kaboom over the head. Um, but he slowly, perhaps it dawned on them that uh, people don't have to be of your faith to be good. Um, the prodigal son, that's a double road trip. The prodigal son wants his inheritance early, and he leaves his family and goes to a foreign land and squanders every bit of it until he's living with the pigs. Something all good Jewish boys want to do is live and work with the pigs. Uh, and at some point he says, what am I doing? Maybe my dad will take me back as a servant. And there's another road trip. And as he's making his way home, his father sees him from a distance and goes running to embrace him. Another model for coming in is recognizing God loves us and seeks to embrace us. And that young man's life has changed. Um. I'm not talking too much about his brother. There's a whole series of things about the brother who doesn't like any of that. Don't bring him home. Kick him out. I was good. He was bad. Um, the prodigal son, another road trip. Yes. Ah, those of you who need to go to this next service, uh, please feel free. Um, Um, you all have had those road trips, right? Um, if you see a fork in the road, take it. That's attributed to Yogi Berra. Uh, Yogi, there's a book of about things he's not sure whether or not he said. He's not sure he ever said that. Um, but he liked that it was attributed to him, so I'm, I'm saying it that way. If you see, if you see a fork in the road, uh, take it. And the rest of that line goes, especially if it's silver. Um, so I, road trips. Um, due to the recommendation of Robert Frost, 
So many people have taken the road not taken that it is now officially to be known as the road taken. In order to take the road not taken, people must now take the road formerly known as the road taken. Thank you. Um, my, my word to you is things happen when you get on the road. Sometimes it's a kaboom. Sometimes it's a mugging. <laughs> Sometimes it's encountering the one who loves you so much that one comes running and embracing. And sometimes it's an aha. But none of it happens if you're not out on the road. Did I wait? Did I skip one? Yeah. So this is the short version of Frost. Um, this is a poetry slam. So I'm on the road in these yellow woods, and the road literally does this. Why? So dang, I got to decide. Google Map says this way. I ignore it. Changed my life. Paraphrased poetry night. Folks, I hope you hit the road. Some of you need to hit the road to uh, class. Others of you need to do something. But I hope you'll keep in mind that idea, particularly those two models of kaboom and aha, and think about how we integrate people who have had both kinds of experiences. Because we're going to need for future generations and for growth to be able to recognize and offer opportunities for each way into the faith. That's going to be a challenge. Maybe we'll find it when we hit that fork in the road. Amen. Anybody got any questions? Feel free. Um, I don't have any answers, but I can say, uh, maybe, aha. Uh -huh. um, but anybody have any questions, seriously? Or